But uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's what the Lord does. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, all of them, all of them completely, and to cleanse us, wash us, get us all dressed in that holy robe of righteousness and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and making us righteous. Amen. All right. Well, we are in part eight of our study of Galatians. We're in the next to the last chapter, chapter five, and it ends in chapter six. And so Galatians grounded in grace. Uh, it's stand fast in the liberty of Christ. And we're going to be looking at verses 5, 1 through 8, um, chapter 5, verses 1 through 18 today. Heard a kid's joke this week. Uh, how would chuckle, right? What does Winnie the Pooh and Alexander the Great have in common? They both have the same middle name. Ooh. Oh, the, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, that's kind of one of those like, uh, right. Uh, yes, I have. I've been hanging out with Hal lately. Uh, but I'm using it as a springboard to make this point, okay. The point is better than the joke. Um. What did Paul, what did Paul and the Judaizers have in common? They both wanted to be right with God. But the Judaizers were ba way off base. Paul saying the way to be right with God is through grace and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Judaizers were saying, oh, everyone needs to be circumcised and go back to some of the, the old laws and, and the Mosaic law and all of this sort of stuff and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And Paul, when he was writing in, in Romans, he said, you know, my heart's desire is that all Israel would be saved. He said, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They have a really zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And then going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God, which is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And he said, you know, Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's not universal salvation, but to everyone who believes, then we have fulfilled the law and we're completely righteous before God. And this was hard for them to accept because they had this magnificent temple, okay, in Jerusalem. And all the males, you know, and, and generally speaking, all the families would go there three times a year. And... When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished in the veil that divided the holy of holies from the holy place was torn from top to bottom, the whole temple complex became obsolete in God's eyes. It's no longer needed. All those priests were no longer needed because that opened the doorway for the priesthood of the believer. You and I don't need anybody in between us to go directly to God anymore. We don't need to be bringing our sacrifices to the temple to be atoned uh, for any, anymore. And you know, it's also just a practical thing. What if we were still under the law? Uh, every year over, I mean, billions of people would have to go to Jerusalem to make sacrifices. Okay. And that would be just crazy. And so they were just having a difficult time. And Paul was trying to open their minds so that they could get it right. Let me just tell you something about the law. The law is kind of like trying to be righteous by obeying the law is like trying to, to get rid of dust by sweeping a dirt floor. The more you sweep the dirt floor, the, what, what's produced? It's more dust. And the harder you try to sweep that dirt floor, the more dust is produced. And so that was the job of the law to bring to our attention, oh my goodness, I'm sinful. We are sinful people and we're unable to actually be righteous before God by absolutely and perfectly keeping the law. And so what Paul and what, what the Lord did and what Paul was preaching is that Jesus Christ laid a new foundation without sin. And we can stand upon the foundation of the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and be completely righteous. 
And to those that were still, you know, in the law, it was just kind of like, whoa. I mean, really? Yes, really. It, Jesus was the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice who takes away or took away the sin of the world to all those who believe. So you see why they were struggling. And Paul was like, no, he wrote to the churches of Galatia. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them anymore. All right, let's go ahead and we're going to read verses. Uh, let's, we're just going to read verses uh, one through four, first of all. But let's, um, let's go to the first slide, point number one, and then we'll read that. Point number one is don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. To keep one part of the law requires you to keep all of it, which is impossible. Attempting to live by the law will keep you separated from Christ and his saving grace. Okay. All right, let's read uh, verses 1 through 4 here. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Meaning going back to the Mosaic law. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. If, I'm saying, if you think that that's going to make you justified with God. He didn't say circumcision is wrong, but if you think that will make you justified and a saved person, it will not. You have become estranged from Christ, meaning the grace of Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace or you're out of grace. Father, I just pray that you would uh, bless this message and bless our understanding and let us rejoice in the grace of, uh, that you give us through Jesus Christ. Lord, it's full and free. It's free grace, but it's not cheap grace because you had to die upon the cross and suffer many things, Lord, for this grace that we now receive so freely. So, Lord, speak through me today. Touch each heart, Lord. Be with all of us, Lord. And guide us and lead us in, the, in this time that we're together. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I just jotted down a few things here. Uh, today, we don't have a lot of people wanting to go back under the Mosaic Law. We, we don't. Even though, when I was uh, with the Baptist Collegiate Ministries, there was a group there that they did the dietary laws of the Old Testament. They, had, they were believers, but they met on... Saturday, and they had all these Jewish rituals they did, and they celebrated Passover and all this. It was kind of a little weird because I was like, why are you kind of scooting back up to the law? Like, don't, you don't need to do that. And they almost had a sense of superiority. I mean, I liked them. Some of them were my friends, but it's like, we're doing all these Jewish things, and you are not. And it's like, yeah, I don't have to do those anymore, okay? But you know what? Some churches or groups can kind of fall into legalism. And here's just a few examples. Maybe they're not great examples, but there are a few examples of legalism. Saved people must take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Saved people must never eat pork or other forbidden foods. Saved people must only read the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, saved people must only attend our church to be saved. Saved people must trust in Jesus and follow this tradition to be saved. Saved people must attend church on the Old Testament Sabbath, which is Saturday. Saved women must only wear dresses. All right. Saved people only sing these types of hymns and this type of music. Saved people must speak in tongues. Uh, saved people's, people's hair must only be a certain way etc 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 and when we get into that we fall back into legalism and there's a lot of other legalistic things that we can fall into when we are saved is christ and christ alone is christ and christ alone is how we are saved uh, james 2 10 said this for whoever shall keep the whole law or try to be justified by the whole law and yet stumble in one point he is guilty of all if you've ever, ever, ever just committed one sin once in your life, you're done. You're done. You've broken the law and you're guilty of the whole law. What? Yes. So it's impossible to keep the whole law. Legalism, let me just, here's a short definition. Legalism is seeking to achieve forgiveness from God and acceptance by God 
through personal obedience or works. Okay? So I'm going to work really hard and God's going to accept me. It's not that we shouldn't obey God. We should obey God, but we don't obey him to be justified by him. We obey him because we love him. In, in, in uh, John 14, 15, John 14, 15 says, Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, you see the difference between if you keep my commandments, I'm going to love you. No, I, because we love him and we put our faith in him and we trust in him, then we obey his commandments. I don't have to obey these commandments and all of these rules to be justified because Christ did that. He finished it all on the cross. Okay, he, he did it all on the cross. Jesus paid it all. Okay, all to him I owe. So, so we don't have to do anything else except trust in him. Uh, in the church, uh, to the church at uh, Colossae, Paul wrote this in 2.20. And verses 20 through 23. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Why are you doing this? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. It appears that really good. Wow, you're really religious because you do all of these things. And uh, you, you have all of these, you know, things that you do and don't do. But he said that really does not impress God. If what impresses God is to love him and to have faith in him and to walk with him according to the Holy Spirit that is within you. We're going to get to that in just a little bit because later on in this chapter, in fact, next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And that's going to be, that's going to be fun. It's going to be very interesting to look how the Holy Spirit manifests himself through us. So uh, Paul here was not dealing with the security of the believer when he said you've fallen from grace. What he was doing, he was he was contrasting the systems of grace and the law as a means of salvation. That's what he was saying. Okay. Uh, you have fallen from the grace that is in the Lord. And if you continue in that, it will keep you separated from the saving grace of Christ. Okay. So he was telling the, the saved not to go back under that bondage. And those that were trusting in the law, that you'll never be saved that way. You'll never be saved that way. Okay, number two, number two, through the Spirit's power, live in faith, hope, and love. The Holy Spirit will give you the right mindset. Saving faith proves its genuine character by works of love. So the saving faith is a loving faith. And, and it, it shows its kindness to others. It is, it's a faith that is born of God, that is energized by God. Verses 5 through 6 simply say this. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith working through love. Faith working through love. And so it says the Spirit within us causes us to eagerly wait for that day that we will be glorified. Presently, you are perfectly righteous in the eyes of God. But we all hope and look forward to that day when our faith uh, and our salvation will be consummated by being glorified and being like Christ. When he appears, we shall be like him, the Bible says. So I'm looking forward to that day when this old body is no longer going to give me any trouble. I'm no longer going to have to groan when I get up out of my chair. Or when I've been on a long car ride, I have to go, whoa, okay, oh, oh, you know, ah, let me get everything moving. I'm not going to have to be taking pills and going to the doctor. I'm not going to do that. And my mind and my body is going to be cleansed of that habitual sin that I always have to fight against. That old nature, that old sinful nature. I'm not going to have to fight that anymore one of these days. And so the Holy Spirit gets us excited about that hope of righteousness by faith that one day will be completely consummated in Christ. Faith works through love. It says, 
uh, but faith working through love. When I was a kid, uh, anybody here ever buy some Mexican jumping beans? I, I, I was so fascinated by those little beans. I would, I don't know, back when you could send off, you know, get these mail order things. I don't know where I got them. I might have sent off the mail, but you get them. And these are little beans. And I was looking at them just this week on, on the, the, the internet. It's amazing. These little beans will like jump a half inch and stuff. And you know what makes them jump, don't you? It's the little larva. There's a moth larva inside, a little worm that squirms around. And he makes this little bean run around and do weird things. And so, kind of an odd illustration, but it works, okay? The Holy Spirit is within us and makes us do righteous things. The reason that we can have faith and love is because it is not just our own human love, but it is the love of the Holy Spirit that animates us and makes us to be like Christ. And so people see us and we are proof of or, or a witness of the, of the presence of God because they should be able to see Christ in us. Let others see Jesus in you. And that's what we should do. That's what we should do is let others see the Lord Jesus Christ in us. Point number three. Beware of the false teachers and their teachings because they're under God's judgment. And if you side with them, you're going to be on the side of God's judgment. You're going to be condemned. Paul points out that the false doctrine of the Judaizers is not of God. He's going to say that when we read the scriptures, nor does he embrace it. Some were falsely claiming that Paul was embracing circumcision and going back under the Mosaic law. And in, and in exasperation, Paul wishes the false teachers would go ahead, just go ahead and mutilate themselves. I'll explain that in just a little bit. That's what the Greek word means. Let's read that, the, the scripture there, verses uh, 7 through 12. You ran well. He said, you started out really well following Jesus. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Like, wh what happened? This persuasion does not come from him, meaning God who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Okay, you're being a bad influence on the rest of the church that's trying to live by faith. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Evidently, Paul wasn't sure who these Judaizers were. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, like some people falsely claim that I do, why do I still su suffer persecution? Why do the Judaizers still persecute me? I'm not doing that. Just don't believe them. All right? Have you ever heard, had, had somebody tell a falsehood about you? And you're going, really? They said that about me? Don't believe them. That's not true. I never said that. I never did that. I never meant that. All right? That's what Paul's saying. He said, then the offense of the cross has ceased. And the reason the cross was offensive is because the, the Jews at that time just could not wrap their brain around a Messiah who suffered and died on a cross. They were looking for a conquering general type of Messiah who would come and and dying on the cross, they just, that was offensive to them. It was a stumbling block to them. He said, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Ouch, pretty harsh. He probably had in mind there was a nature goddess cult of, at that time. A nature goddess cult at that time. And this goddess's name was Sibel. And the devout male followers and the male priest, in order to show their supreme Devotion to Sibel would castrate themselves. And this is the word that is, was commonly in my research, this word that he uses would cut themselves off, refers to castration. And so Paul was basically saying this. If these Judaizers are so insistent on circumcision as a means of pleasing God, well then why don't they just go ahead and castrate themselves as an act of their ultimate dedication to God? Just go ahead and do it. Kind of makes us, ouch, you know. Ouch. Really, that's one of the harshest things he said. Just go ahead all the way and just castrate yourself and whatever. So he's saying, do, you know, he was getting, as they say in, the, in, in southwestern Oklahoma, Paul was getting a belly full 
of those Judaizers, all right? I got a belly full of them. Uh, Jude 12 and 13 says this, Jude 12, 13, speaking of false teachers, these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. And remember earlier, he said, they just want you to follow them. Really, they're not trying to really get you to follow God. They want you to get in their little group, their little clique. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up, with their, uh, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wandering stars might kind of refer to like a, a, a falling star or a meteor. It kind of shines real bright for a moment and then burns out and is in blackness or darkness forever. Yeah, they may have their moment, but it's not, it's not going to do you any good in the long run. And this is what Paul was trying to get through their heads. Do not follow them. Um, and point four, point four. Use, he's saying, use your liberty as an opportunity to love and serve one another. The moral ethics of the Old Testament are fulfilled by loving one another, okay? If you love somebody, you're not going to murder them. If you love somebody, you're not going to steal for them. You're not going to lie to them. You're not going to uh, commit adultery and, 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 and offend your, your wife or your husband or uh, uh, defile someone's marriage or relationship. You're not going to do that. So it says when we fail to love one another, we basically act like wild animals, you know, sometimes when you read things in the news, it's like people are acting like wild animals. And, you know, t today there's a big conflict, you know, in Israel between Hamas and the Gaza area and the Israelis. And, and you know, they're just killing one another, okay? Our, you know, we have to walk in love because when we do not walk in love, we become vicious. We do. And we don't, when we don't walk in the spirit, we become vicious. Um, Verses 13 through 15. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, you see how often he brings up love? Through love, ser serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, and that's going to be the word of love. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, biting, it's crazy, huh? Beware lest you be consumed by one another. Biting, he's, he's saying, you become like a wild animal, just clawing and biting and wrestling with one another and just, you know, all kinds of things happen when we don't walk in love. Bad things happen. And so John eight thirty six, Jesus said, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. He said, we need to be free, but use that freedom to be more Christ-like. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve us and to redeem us. And also talking about when we don't walk in love, James 3.16 says, For where, uh, where envy and self-seeking exist, selfishness exists, it's all about me exist, confusion and look at that, every evil thing are there. When we become self-centered, it's all about me. When we envy and compete with one another, every evil thing is there. So he said, walk in love and walk in liberty, serving one another. And then finally, he comes up on a passage that's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. And it's point number five is going to entail that. Follow this fail-safe prescription for overcoming the, desi the desires of the flesh. He's going to be talking about walking in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, we not only overcome the lustful and carnal desires of the flesh, but we also rise above the prideful and idolatrous desires of our fallen nature, which can lead back, as in Paul's time, to the Mosaic Law and the bondage of legalism. Sometimes why people are attracted to legalism is because you can say, look what I've done. I keep all of these laws. I am very pious and righteous. Okay? Really, yeah. Uh, we, it's kind of like, I, 
I'm better than you are because I, I, I can do all this myself. Salvation is saying, I have blown it. I am unholy. I am unrighteous. I am a sinner and I need to be saved. And I beat my chest and God have mercy upon me. Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And then you are saved. You are born again. You become holy and righteous. So the problem when Jesus was here in his ministry, he was preaching to the Pharisees. They were so self-righteous that they missed God's righteousness that was through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, verses 16 through 18. I say then, walk or live, that means walk, live in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, like oil and water. They don't mix, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we are to be led under the Spirit. And, and I remember, I don't remember the, the professor's name, but when I was in school, he said, this is the promise, uh, Galatians 5, 16, that it works in Paris, France. It works in Africa. Uh, it works in Timbuktu. It works wherever you are. He said, students, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, no matter where you are on this planet. And that, that's, you know, that's a promise right there. Because sometimes we are tempted. Sometimes we are like, wow, that would be, that, that, mm, that pull, that dark pull. I know I shouldn't do it. But it, listen, that's when we need to call out to the Lord and say, Lord, purify me. And just, I just want to live in your spirit. And just, just come and let me be filled with your spirit. The Bible says we should be filled with the spirit. We should be led by the spirit. We should live in the Holy Spirit. We should do that. Romans 8, 12 through 14 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, according to works, etc., etc., you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the Holy Spirit is like, you know, like kryptonite was to Superman. You know, it made him real weak. It, it just disabled him. Well, the Holy Spirit is like kryptonite to the flesh. It causes the flesh to be dormant, to die. And we're always going to have to work, bad, do that battle because we have an old nature within us still. And we have a new nature. But we are born again and the Holy Spirit will give you the power to walk in the new nature. Let me just give you some short definitions of kind of what walking in the Spirit is. This is what John Piper said. Walking in the Spirit is what you do when the desires produced by the Spirit are stronger than the desires produced by the flesh. So when the, when you, the desires of the Spirit become a priority over the desires of the flesh. Uh, walking in the Spirit, this is what I wrote, means living in harmony with the new you who has been born of God. It's in harmony with the new you. You're, you're living according to the new person that you are in Jesus Christ. Uh, living in the spirit is inviting and seeking the wisdom, influence, and leadership of God's spirit on a continual basis. Because the Holy Spirit is also God's spirit. Also referred to in the New Testament as the spirit of Christ. So they are all the same. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. But the Bible emphasizes the Holy Spirit because that's who you are. You are holy. That Greek word is you are the, the, the hagioi of God, the holy ones. And most of the time in the New Testament, it's translated as saints. You are the saints of God. It means you are the holy ones of God. I remember I had another professor. I thought it was kind of simple when he described about walking in the spirit. And, but, you know, I've never forgotten it. Just one of those things kind of stuck in your head. He said, you know, walking in the spirit and living for God... It's kind of like being in a, two, uh, in, in a house, a really beautiful house with a dark and dingy basement. And upstairs, this beautiful house and looking out the windows at the beautiful garden and everything represents walking in the spirit and living with God. And then when you go down into the basement, 
that dark, dingy basement without windows, that's living in the flesh. So he said, whenever you find yourself in that dark, dingy basement, go up those stairs and get in the spirit. And it's very simple. I thought, well, that's a pretty simple illustration. But, you know, it's kind of right. We all have, again, that dual nature. We do have that dark, dingy basement down there. But if we will go upstairs, we can live in the spirit, in the light of God, in the joy of God, in the peace of God, in the fruit of the spirit. And so we have to acknowledge, yes, I do have a dark and dingy basement, but I'm going to live upstairs. I'm living upstairs. I'm going to look out these beautiful windows and see all the beauty and, and let the light come in of this beautiful place that the Lord has given me. Because before you're saved, that's all you have is a dark and dingy basement. That's all you have to live in. You have this hovel. And when you're saved, God lifts you out of that. So let me say this, uh, uh, something else about walking in the spirit. When we're walking in the spirit, in the will of God, you will generally have a restful, peaceful feeling in your heart. Now, it's kind of hard for me to describe that, but it'll just be a peace at rest. And when you think about something or doing something, you're going to see a green light. We all love green lights. I hate green lights. Sometimes, I mean, I hate red lights. I love green lights. But sometimes when we're coming, uh, when I'm riding with Don Land, all I hit is red lights. He, he told me that that's true. His granddaughter said, Don, I'm not going to, you can't ride in my car anymore. Because every time you get in my car, all I hit are red light after red light after red light. Sorry, Don, I had to tell that. By the way, Don went with me last, uh, last uh, what day was it that we went down there? Yeah, down there to, uh, to uh, Wednesday. Uh, to Chickasha. But living in the spirit is, is peaceful. When we get in the flesh, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And you will be able to sense the Holy Spirit will make it known to you that you are grieving the Holy Spirit. And you'll kind of have an inner red stoplight that goes off and tells you to stop what you're doing and make a U-turn. Now, I'm not going to say any more about that. But you just, after living for a while with the Lord, walking with the Lord, you're going to be able to start sensing that. So, the Holy Spirit is the DNA of God that's within you that makes you a child of God. It's the DNA of God within you that makes you a child of God. And when I was a kid, uh, I went through yo-yos and tops and marbles and hula hoops. But I also had this phase of my life where I really liked gyroscopes. Remember the little gyroscopes that they used to have? And in some way, the Holy Spirit's like a gy gyroscope. In fact, if you have a smartphone, there's a gyroscope in your smartphone because you do like this, like that, like that, like that. There's a gyroscope. Steve Jobs was the first one to put them in iPhones. It's a tiny little gyroscope. And a gyroscope basically is this. The rotation of the gyroscope provides an objective reference for navigation or for navigational systems. It's an objective reference for navigational systems because that gyroscope keeps one direction and no matter what you move around it it tries to keep that same direction and so that's what the holy spirit does okay enough said about that that's that's what the holy spirit does within us a closing illustration well i would go over all my points but i think you got them okay you can just look at your uh as you leave look at your bulletin they're on the back there there was an explorer, uh, named, he, was, he was a great Norwegian explorer named Roald Amundsen. And he was quite the explorer. He was the first one to discover the South Pole. And he was also the first one that kind of really located the magnetic North Pole. Not the, not the North Pole, but the magnetic North Pole. And so he would go off on these journeys that sometimes would last a year or three years. And his wife, of course, would worry about him. She didn't know where he was. They didn't have phones back then. This was about 19, the early 1900s. This particular trip, I think, was 1911. But on one of his trips to the North Pole, he took a homing pigeon with him. And I think that's just fascinating how birds know their direction, all right? It's, it's sad to say that sometimes birds know their directions better than we humans, all right? But he took a homing pigeon with him, 
And when he got up to the North Pole, he opened the cage and this homing pigeon flew back 2,000 miles to Norway to his wife's house. And one day she opened the door and she saw the pigeon that he took with him flying around her house. And she was so excited because he's alive. My husband is alive. She knew he was alive. And you see, when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended. And the Holy Spirit tells us on a continual basis as we walk in the Spirit, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. It's a continual witness to us and to others that our Savior lives and he is the right hand of God making intercession for us. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Amen? Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what walking in the Holy Spirit does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So it is a witness. It is a witness. Jesus is alive. Now, the way you can become alive in Christ is to know him as your personal Savior. So I'm going to conclude this morning as I usually do, but it's always from my heart. And I know those of you that are Christians, you're cheering Anyone that would make a decision, you're cheering them on. Because new life can only come through being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he sends his Holy Spirit within you and you become a new creation in Christ. If you're watching on social media this morning, all you have to do is say a simple prayer. And I'm going to just give you, you can follow me in this simple prayer or say your own simple prayer. Or if you're here this morning, just say, dear Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I now trust you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me and taking away all my sins. I now will follow you the rest of my life. Help me to fulfill my divine destiny in you. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. And again, if you're serious about that, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to show. You're going to read your Bible. You're going to begin to, to pray. You're going to be able to have that desire. You're wanting to be with other Christians. You're going to want to be baptized in believer's baptism. So let us know. Call the church or write us or whatever. Let us know that you made that decision, okay? And if you're here this morning and made that decision, uh, you have another prayer need, you come up. Hal and I will be up here. Would you please stand? Would you please stand as we turn this over to the Lord? You, this is his invitation. Follow as you are led this morning. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my life, Lord, be glorified today. Sing one more verse. If you need to come, you come. In your church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In your church, Lord, be glorified today. Okay, don't forget we have a staff meeting today, staff at 4 o'clock. Uh, also, we've changed our evening study from, uh, it's not going to be on grief. We're going to be doing a six-week study on angels, which is very fascinating by Dr. Jack Graham. So I want to encourage you to, uh, you know, come and I know you'll, you'll be blessed. Also, uh, Debbie Briner is here. She said she has something she wants to say to us today. And I said, sure. Uh, you can come, so come on, Debbie. She has a whole presentation. Okay. Whoa. Okay, be seated just a moment. I think she's going to do more than just say something.
I don't get it. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, and and she has. Would you? Would you? Okay, come here, Hal. Help me. Oh, oh. and we're gonna let you go after this. But two, and Don can come up and help. But there's got to be two for each person because you have to flip these one by one, and I can narrate or somebody else can. Uh, let me. Uh, let me. Let me narrate. Wait a minute. Which one's the first? Okay, let me, I'm going to read this. Oh, okay, let's okay, let's get over here. Okay. We survived helping I've got my mic. Go ahead. We survived helping. Hold that one up. Debbie Briner move. Her jewelry making supplies. Uh all her clothes and Yeah, it's all her clothes and her jewelry making supplies. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Debbie. All right. And thank you, church, for supporting Helping Hands. I know there's been some others, but, you know, all glory goes to, to the Lord because that's why we do what we do. All right. Stand up and you are dismissed in the love of Jesus. Have a great day. Have a great day. All right. Good job. Good job.